In today's video, I'm going to share some examples of times that I had to reduce a veteran's service-connected condition or conditions as a prior VA rating specialist, so stick around. Hello, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dwayne Kimball, owner and founder of KMD89 VA Claims Consulting, United States Army veteran and retired VA rating specialist. In today's video, I'm going to share some examples when I used to adjudicate claims as a rating specialist with the VA, times that I had to reduce a veteran service connected condition or conditions, okay? I didn't like doing it. I hated, actually just hated doing these particular ratings, but Per the VA guidelines, I had to do it based on something that the veteran did due to lack of education. So I'm going to share some of those examples with you so you don't fall into those same pitfalls, okay? But before we get into today's video, make sure you go out and get my new book, VA Claim Success. It is on Amazon. I think this is an awesome book, and it's a guide for you to help you win your VA compensation. I'll put the link in the description section below. So make sure you go out, purchase the book, and support, and I definitely appreciate it, okay? So, it was several times that I had to reduce a veteran's service-connected condition or condition. So, not only, it was times that not only did I have to reduce one condition, it could have been multiple. So I was thinking about this because I'm getting a lot of comments and people saying, oh, the VA just out to reduce, out to reduce, out to reduce. So if you think that, if you think that's all VA raters are looking to do is just reduce veterans, this video is not for you. If you're a veteran that want to learn the pitfalls, so your service-connected conditions doesn't get reduced, then you need to continue watching. Okay? So I'm gonna got a few examples. I have a few examples, and I'm gonna go over those with you. Okay? Number one, when the veteran submitted a claim for increase for a service-connected condition and the percentage had been in effect for five years or less, okay? So what that means is if you file a claim for increase for, let's just say, migraines at 30%, you file an increase, and that 30% has been in effect less than five years, and you go to that C&P exam, and that C&P exam shows improvement. Now, I'm not saying go to the C&P exam. So if you go to the C&P exam and you, uh, the examiner conducts the exam and that exam is sent back, when the exam is sent back to the regional office and the radio reviews it and it shows that it's improved, guess what? They have to do a proposal to reduce. Now, if that reduction does not change your overall percentage they don't have to do a proposal uh, for reduction or a proposal to reduce. They can go ahead and reduce you because if it doesn't change your overall percentage, it's not going to change your pay. Okay? So that's something to keep in mind. All right? Number two, when a veteran filed a claim for IU and was not educated. Okay, this is what I mean by that. IU is not a standalone claim. It's a claim for increase for the service-connected conditions, you, the veteran, states keep you from gainful employment, okay? So it's not a standalone claim, so it falls into the first example I gave you, okay? It's a claim for increase. So think about this. You decide you're 90% and you decide to file a claim for increase. First thing you want to do is find out which conditions prevent you from gainful employment? What are the percentages for each one of those conditions, if there's, if there's multiple ones, okay? How long have those percentages been in effect? Guess where you can find that information? The VA rating code sheet, okay? So I have a video where I'm explaining what a VA rating code sheet and the VA, uh, uh, I'm talking about the VA uh, code sheet, okay? I'll link that video to the end of this video, all right? So when you go there, you'll see the effective date, and you count. If it's over five years, okay. 
if it's under five years, then you definitely need to be, educate yourself on the next higher percentage because that's what you want to be talking about when you go to that particular exam. Okay? So if you go to the exam, that percentage has been in effect less than five years, it shows improvement, they can do a proposal to reduce or actually reduce it if it doesn't change your overall percentage. So sort of uh, the same example as number one, okay? Number three, when the veteran was granted a higher percentage for a joint replacement and came in years later to claim the other joint secondary, okay, to the primary joint, the veteran never had a joint replacement on the primary condition. Here's an example. Veteran service connected for right hip replacement. Comes in several years later and claims left hip secondary to the right hip. Rater receives the CMP exam. On the CMP exam, it asks, has the veteran had a joint replacement? The doctor checks no for both. Now, the rater looks at that, and they should say, huh, I looked at the rating code sheet, the previous rating code sheet, to make sure the veteran was service-connected for right hip replacement. Yep. And they start to think, what's going on? Then they go back and they look at the rating decision. Yep, we granted him uh, uh, convalescence for a year. Man, okay, let me go look at the operative report. Looks at the operative report. The operative report shows that the veteran never had a right hip replacement. So now the Raider has to propose to sever, take away the right hip replacement at 30% and then do a proposal to reduce from 30 to 10. And then if the examiner says or gives a negative opinion for the left hip, then they have to deny that claim. Or if it's a grant, then they can go ahead and they can grant it. All right? So you want to make sure you're reading your rating decisions because I've seen veterans do just that, okay? And they'll say, oh, the VA did this or the VA did that, but they're not telling the whole story. They're not saying, oh, I got paid a whole year for a right hip replacement that I never had and I knew it, but I never told the VA, okay? So... Yeah, I'll, I'll, sometimes you got to take that with a grain of salt, all right? Moving right along. Number four, when the veteran reported to an exam for the incorrect claim condition, did not verify, did, did not verify before reporting, and it was in effect for less than five years. What I mean by that, I've seen veter VSRs or someone requesting a CMP exam Request the incorrect CMP exam. So I'll give you an example. The veteran comes in who wants to file a claim or increase for their back condition. The VSO or whoever is requesting that exam screws it up, and they request an exam for increase for PTSD, which the veteran did not request an increase for. And that percentage for the PTSD has been in effect less than five years. The vet goes to the exam. One, the vet is not thinking that they're there for the back condition. But they go to the exam, PTSD, they just start talking, right? What that vet should have done is ask that third-party examiner, hey, what am I reporting for? I only claim the increase for the back. I didn't claim an increase for my PTSD. I don't want to mess with that. I'm fine with that percentage. I think that's where I need to be. And they'll say, oh, well, the VA uh, wanted you to come in. If you don't have a routine future, why are you showing up for that exam? VA employees do make mistakes. Okay? I'll link that video to the end of this video. Okay? So you want to verify, am I showing up for audio exam? If you file a claim for tinnitus, Am I showing up for a mental exam if I file a claim for PTSD, depression, major uh, depressive disorder, mood disorder, or whatever? Okay? Am I showing up for a neurological exam for my migraines? These are questions that you need to be asking when you get that letter in the mail or th these people call you for these third-party examiners, of, of third-party exams. VA employees are not perfect. I've made mistakes. It wasn't done intentionally. Okay? 
So we as veterans have to hold ourselves accountable as well. All right. So you always want to make sure you confirm that shows up for the exam that didn't file a claim for. In this instance, this example I gave you, PTSD, when it should have been for migraines, that PTSD percentage was in effect less than five years. It comes back. Now, not only do we have to do a proposal if it changes the overall percentage, but then we still got to request an exam for the migraine, but now the veteran is confused. We got evidence showing improvement. You got to use it, okay? Now, number five. Okay, number five. When the veteran was denied an increase in a service-connected condition due to the exam showing improvement, the condition was in effect more than five years, was not protected by the 20-year rule, and came back in within five years of the previous exam, and the second exam showed improvement as well. So what I'm saying is, let me give you an example, okay? Veteran service-connected PTSD at 30% comes in, let's just say, January 2020. Goes to the exam. They confirm and continue it even though it showed improvement, but that 30% has been in effect more than five years, okay? So they can't do a proposal to reduce. You need two exams when it's over five years to show improvement before you can do a proposal to reduce or reduce it if it doesn't affect the overall percentage. So VET comes in January 2020, gets the uh, rating the same year, comes back in 2023, Goes to the exam, it shows improvement. Now they're going to reduce it because now they have two exams within five years to do a proposal to reduce or reduce if it changes the overall uh, percentage, okay? So those are just five. There are some other ones, but those are just five that I thought of. Uh, I didn't want to go too long with this video, okay? So those are reasons, again, those are reasons that as a previous rating specialist, I had to reduce veterans. I didn't like doing it. Trust me. If I didn't do it and the quality team pulled it, it could have been an error on me or would have been an error on me. And I get so many errors over a certain, minute, a certain amount of time, then I get fired. Okay, so I'm definitely following the VA guidelines when it comes to that. But I wanted to share this video with you. So if you fall within any of those scenarios, you can avoid those pitfalls. So again, if you're one of these veterans that think, oh, the VAs is all bad, VA Raiders, they get trained, just deny, 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 deny until you die, this video is not for you. It's for, this video is for the veterans that want to make sure they become educated and can maneuver around those pitfalls so they don't make those simple mistakes from not being educated. So, again, as always, make sure you like, subscribe, hit that notification button, and don't forget to share this video with your fellow veterans. Thank you.